So I am honored to introduce Kelly Hayes Macaloni, whose career has focused on architecture and education. Kelly is the director of the Capital Plan Group at Universidad at Buffalo and has played a central role in the current and future building projects that are transforming our three campuses. She has, among other things, overseen the master plan for the revitalization of South Campus and the relocation of the medical and biomedical sciences to the downtown campus. So Kelly moves mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, she also wears many other hats, including as president of the Lipsy Architecture Center of Buffalo, a co-curator of a groundbreaking exhibition on Louise Bethune that opened at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society in 2011. Uh, and as you heard, co-creator with me of Architect Barbie, Adal Intel, launched in 2011, and as researcher and writer. And the talk we'll be hearing today is based on the culmination of years of research on Louise Bethune, including uh, some recent and very exciting discoveries. Kelly's accomplishments as an architect are numerous, and last year she was inducted into the uh, College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architects. This makes her only the second woman uh, from Buffalo to receive that honor. The first was Louise Bethune in 1889. <laughs> 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 I want to mention uh, Kelly's 10 Women Buffalo talk on the power dress, which has been viewed over 14,000 times. And I suspect that today we will be uh, hearing about dresses as well as buildings. So I will uh, stop here and welcome to the There are certain facts of uh, life, and one of them is that when I take to the stage, I will always talk about Jesus Platoon. <laughs> architecture and yes, absolutely dresses. <laughs> Before I begin, I just want to thank some all of you for attending this. I am blessed to count many of you as dear friends and and also innovators in Buffalo. And thank you for all of your work for advancing this city in this country. I look around and of course I see Joe and Bernice and Norma and Rolla and but then there are so many other wonderful innovators here in Buffalo. Amber Dixon, Joyce Wang, Mary uh, Roberts, and, uh, and boys can be innovators too, Robert Shipley. <laughs> so it's wonderful to stand in this in this beautiful building that was also designed by an innovator Chica Mori, and across the course from the wonderful building that was innovative in its time and still teaches us lessons about domesticity, the Darwin Martin House. But today, right now, I'm going to speak to you about a very special time in Buffalo's history, our Gilded Age, also known as our Golden Age in Buffalo, from roughly 1881 to uh, 1901. In October 7th, 1893, an issue of the American Women's Illustrated World ran a special article titled, Some Distinguished Women of Buffalo. The opening paragraph reads as follows. Buffalo has always had clever women. We are told that had a sketch of the town been written when our century, the 19th century, was young, justice would have demanded that many tributes be paid to the worth and brilliancy of the women who are at that time shunned in constellated brightness among the pioneer homes of the Queen City of the Lakes. There are faces that will now and then steal from out of the mists of time to remind Buffalo of a heritage of gentle femininity and intellectually, an inheritance the same in kind which the American woman in general has received from her colonial and her predecessor. Self-reliance and a more systematic mental training have been added to the birthright, and the unique 19th century womanhood is here. And here we are today, honoring our unique sister innovators of the 21st century, and remembering the women in Buffalo who impacted their city through innovation and industry during its golden age. 
I would also argue that those monuments have not been erected yet, but uh, hopefully uh, that will come to pass soon. The article contained approximately 100 biographies in 10 categories. Several of these categories are what we might now consider Gilded Age frivolity, such as recitation and China painting. Yet many more categories highlight the women who clearly earned their living and distinguished themselves through their careers. Women were active in newspapers, medicine, business, real estate, and architecture, just to name a few. And the philanthropists who were identified were leading very large charity, healthcare, or educational organizations, and were effectively doing the work of senior administrators today. Three of the innovators I will discuss in this paper were profiled, Mariah Love, Harriet Townsend, and Louise Bethune. All three left a legacy from which we benefit today. They and their friends and colleagues also impacted their built environment by demanding a form of equality that existed beyond the domestic realm for the first time, very similar to what Despina preceded this talk with. Scholars consider the decades following the U.S. Civil War as the era when the U.S. emerged from the shadow of Great Britain as the innovative and economic leader in the world stage. The factors that contributed to this ascent were a deepened national transportation network system, the increase of mechanized production methods in industry and the distribution of goods, per capita output and consumption doubled, and at the same time, savings increased, and a strong population growth, in particular, hardworking immigrants. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> Those of us who know Buffalo's history may well believe that these scholars were speaking specifically about this city's ascent. For it was the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825 and its subsequent enlargements terminated in Buffalo that provided the country the first water lake waterway link between the East Coast and the Middle West. This enabled the transport of large quantities of goods between the East and West, thus unlocking the rich vastness of the country's natural resources. And almost overnight, Buffalo became a mercantile and industrial powerhouse. Then Nikola Tesla unleashed the mighty force of electricity at Niagara Falls, and Buffalo exploded. Of course, we all know this story. Buffalo's population grew from 155,000 in 1881 to 352,000 in 1900. So it doubled, more than doubled, and became the seventh largest city in the United States in its zenith. Her wealth was spread amongst established families in the area, but also newly minted industrialists and innovators. In a recent study, on settings that encourage inventors' work during this period, i.e. Tesla, Edison, and others, the following were empirical facts regarding their lives. These inventors were more educated than average. These inventors came from well-educated families themselves. The inventors were likely to have moved to a region more conducive to, to innovation, i.e. those places which were more populated, densely populated, and also wealthy. Inventors were identified early and mentored. They were, uh, more inventive states grew faster. Innovation correlated to population growth. And finally, innovation strongly correlated with social mobility. In other words, innovative talent was nurtured and compensated. Are these empirical facts transferable to the lives of the innovative women in Buffalo during this time? We'll see. <laughs> in 1881 was an auspicious year for our women innovators, since during this year each got their official start. Mariah Love's long sought after dream of opening a daycare service, known as a creche, for working mothers finally opened. The Ninth Congress for the Advancement of Women, the vehicle from which Harriet Townsend launched her advocacy career, culminating in the work of the Women's Education and Industrial Union, 
took place at the Buffalo Library in early October. And that same month, Louise Blanchard, later to be Louise Bethune, left her mentor, Richard Waite, to open her own office and become the first professional woman architect. Bill Maggio, who we may know as the chairman of 43 North, says that one important ingredient to innovation is a collision of ideas or events that create the tension and need for innovation. That occurred in 1881. As a terminus of the canal, Buffalo attracted a sudden increase in new populations of immigrants who were mixing with the established families of the Rumseys, the Knoxes, the Shulcocks. There was wealth, there was economic opportunity, and there was social disparity. Ultimately, the disparity between the rich and the poor in a very condensed area climaxed during the Deep Depression in the late 1870s, and community leaders convened to discuss coordinated and rational efforts of relief. The Charity Organization Society was formed, the first of its kind in the U.S., and Mariah Love's moment had arrived. Mariah Love came from a family of progressive professionals. Her father, Thomas Cutting Love, was a lawyer, a surrogate judge of Erie County, and an abolitionist whose family participated in the Underground Railroad Movement to transport former slaves over the Niagara River to Canada in safety. As a young adult, she was exposed to the crash system of France. In her words, I found that every parish there had its own crash, where not only the children of working women could be taken care of, but those of other people, that the districts were conveniently small so that children were not too far from home, and not only care, but a beginning and instruction towards school entry was part of its scope. She had tried on numerous occasions to open a daycare for working mothers that was both philanthropic and also educational similar to the French model, which she had observed. But it took the depression of the 1870s for the recognition that the sole support of many low-income families lay with mothers who did not have aid for childcare. The Fitch Crash, nationally recognized as the first daycare center for work, children of working women in the United States, served as a model to be emulated by other American cities. It was the first to implement affordable kindergarten in the U.S. The building was a dry goods store that was owned by Benjamin Fitch, a native Buffalonian who donated this building for use by the crash, which formally opened on January 6, 1881. The modest building defined a new architectural typology, which has never been more relevant than it is today. The crash had a capacity of 50 children, provided three meals, clothing, baths, naps, physical examinations, and educational programs for the children. Seeing need for additional support for these working mothers, Love expanded the portfolio of the crash to offer convalescent care services to working mothers. In her introduction, Despina spoke of the women demanding new types of spaces for their newly found identities. In the work of Mariah Love, she too was demanding new spaces and services, but for women desperate for support for identities they had not sought nor wanted, that of widowed or abandoned mothers. Mariah was gifted with an unusual social awareness and worldliness, and her ability to navigate political, social, and religious disparities. She was a woman of influence, who used that influence for the public good. The Fitch Crash was formed on the auspices of the Charity Organization Society of Buffalo, and according to Nancy Smith, Dean of the School of Social Work at UB, uh, states that the Charity Organization Society was a pioneering organization of social theory that led to the emergence of social work as a professional occupation. Of the biographies listed in Some Distinguished Women of Buffalo, None was more admiring than that of Harriet Townsend and her Women's Education and Industrial Union. A well-educated daughter of a prominent Buffalo lawyer, Harriet married her industrialist husband and enjoyed a life in literary circles and successfully pursued ambitions of educational and social reform. The mission of the Women's Education and Industrial Union 
was to increase fellowship among women in order to promote the best practical methods for securing their educational and social advancement. The spirit of the union is to meet the needs of all. The theory is that all have needs, whether they are receiving the benefits or bestowing them. Indeed, the ambition of the union was to promote education and social reform for women, regardless of social status. Its motto was, each for all and all for each. Membership was one dollar. According to her 1916 book, Reminiscence of Famous Women, Townsend met the women's rights leaders Julia Ward Howe, Frances Willard, and Edna Cheney when she served on the planning committee for the 9th Congress for the Advancement of Women in Buffalo. It was after this event that she began to galvanize her ideas for reform. In 1884, she invited Abby, uh, Abby Morton Diaz, founder of the Women's Education and Industrial Union of Boston, to speak at the Fitz Crush on Swan Street. Within two weeks, she had established the Women's Union in Buffalo. We no longer listen to the selfish moralist who cries, let the woman stay in her own home, her only safe haven. It is not, we repeat, an association of benevolent, well-to-do women joined for the purpose of reaching down to help the poor and persecuted women, but a union of all classes and conditions of women. The concept was unique in the US, and the union to be candid, was not always successful in achieving that type of equality among its 1,000 members by today's standards. However, their results were truly remarkable. In 1893, <coughs> President Harry Townsend reported the following accomplishments. 8,531 collected wages withheld uh, unjustly from working women. A gymnasium established and treatment available for women with physical disabilities. Lectures day and evening by leading physicians, including uh, Roswell Park, and other leading professionals in the community. Employment obtained for 3,000 women. Classes in dressmaking, reading, arithmetic, penmanship, typewriting, book writing, bookkeeping, sorry, stenography, French, German, offered to 1,556 women. Aid for 1,000 people in need social and free literary and musical entertainments, and a free library. They'd only been in existence less than 10 years at this point. They had another 12 years to go. Regarding reform, the accomplishments were even more pronounced. Placement of matrons in three police stations and the county jail. Women placed on the board of school examiners. Two women trustees of the Buffalo Hospital for the Insane. successfully lobbied for the New York State law establishing equal guardianship rights for women in the case of divorce. In 1890, the union outgrew its original headquarters, the Babcock House, at the corner of Delaware and Niagara Square. Fundraising for the new building proved an easy task, and they were quickly poised to hire an architect. Lucky for them, the first woman architect in the United States, Louise Bethune, resided in their city. Given the mission of the Institute, hiring Louise Bethune would have seemed compulsory. However, the union solicited the services of Richard Waite, who donated his work to the cause. This tone deafness on the part of the union's leadership may well be attributed to their status as volunteers. They freely donated their time and those of their spouses for the good of the union. They may very well have approached with you for expertise, but a staunch believer in equal pay for equal remuneration, Bethune was not in the business of pro bono work, <laughs> even though both her husband and mentor Wade had contributed in this manner to the union. Mm -hmm. Bethune aside, Richard Wade's building was a significant example of Richardson Romanesque, and it did provide appropriate space for the special and much needed activities that took place at the Union. Indeed, when the Union closed its doors in 1915, the building was donated to the, to the University of Buffalo to house its first College of Arts and Sciences. UB, as you probably know, was founded in 1848 
uh, as a school of medicine. And in 1892, the building, I'm sorry, 1892, a dentistry department was formed. The building was renamed Townsend Hall. And at its opening, Charles, uh, Chancellor Charles P. Norton said of Harriet Townsend, the Women's Union has founded the university, and here is the woman who founded the union. So I, I may be the only one, but I do, refer to her as UB's founding mother. <laughs> Both Mariah Love and Harriet Townsend were Buffalo women of privilege who used their status in the community to do what women had been doing for generations, help those less fortunate. However, the manner with which they performed this work scale and impact were both significant and are still relevant today. With the Fitch Crest and the Charity Organization Society, Mariah Love's efforts lay the groundwork for the profession of social work. And Harriet Townsend challenged the social norms, the class system of the day, and the Women's Education and Industrial Union expanded higher education offerings in the region. She effectively created a trade school and then helped establish a liberal arts program in what was a professional school, and very limited in its offerings. Our next innovator did not enjoy the wealth and social status of Lover Townsend. However, she did possess determination, dedication to her craft, and supporters who enabled her to take her place among Buffalo's innovators. Louise Blanchard was born in Waterloo, New York, and was homeschooled by her parents, both of whom were teachers. The family moved to Buffalo when Blanchard was 12 years old, and she attended Buffalo High School until graduation in 1874. The team's interest in architecture grew from a caustic remark made, to her school, made in her school. Her stubbornness prevailed, and from 1874 to 1876, she prepared to attend Cornell's New School of Architecture, but was offered an internship with the prominent Buffalo architect, Richard Waite, which she accepted. At that time, internships were the most common form of training for architects. We don't know the circumstances behind the offer, but Waite had apprenticed in New York City under the prominent architect, John Kellum, at a time when young married, unmarried women were flocking to the city for work after the Civil War. The influx was a prominent social issue in Wake's time in New York City. Indeed, his mentor designed the Working Women's Hotel for department store magnate A.T. Stewart, the first of its kind, while Wake was with him. <clears throat> Maybe this experience resonated when he met Louise Blanchard. Regardless, it is clear that Wake was impressed with the determined young woman and he became the first mentor of her career. There she was trained as an architect. In her entry in A Woman of the Century biography, she wrote, the hours were from eight to six and the pay was small, but her employer's library was at her service. Wade prided himself on the fact that he did not accept work in which he could not be personally involved. As such, he no doubt closely supervised the work of all apprentices. Among the projects that Bethune worked on was the Pierce Palace Hotel, the only hotel she designed before the Hotel Lafayette. She also met her future husband and business partner, Robert Bethune, while working for Waite. Bethune was a draftsman there at the same time. In October 1881, Bethune announced the opening of her firm, coinciding with the Ninth Congress of the Association for the Advancement of Women. As a pioneer in the field of architecture, Bethune faced many obstacles. Concerns were raised in this time period that women did not have the intellect nor talent to practice architecture, and it was long thought to be an inappropriate profession for women. In the 1879 Congress of the Advancement of, of the Association of the Advancement of Women, Martha McKay presented a paper on the need for women architects much to the amusement of the daily press who countered that the idea that a woman would climb over rafters and ridge poles as men did was too ludicrous to be entertained. And the June, 19, uh, the June 1910 issue of Architect and Engineer California 
published women as architects. The article listed many reasons why women did not have the innate skill set for the profession and ended with the declaration that large drawings necessitate large boards and the strain of free chief is physically more than any woman should be called upon to bear. <laughs> But, in addition to being the first, Fitzhugh was also innovative in her work. She chose architecture just as the vocation was emerging from craft to profession. Architecture as a vehicle for servicing the public good was becoming more relevant by the day. Two emerging typologies, the school and the factory, were being built in Buffalo, and the general need for fireproof buildings that manage heating, water, and sewer effectively was a real concern in this bustling city. Immediately upon establishing their firm, Bethune & Bethune, they started working for the Buffalo Public Schools and Superintendent James Crooker. Crooker was implementing the first master plan for the newly formed school district, with plans to build many new schools to meet the needs of the growing population. Crooker had a clear idea of the types of schools he wanted to build, and he worked with Bethune and other city firms for the next 10 years. The firm designed over 18 schools in Buffalo and the surrounding region. In the 1893 Women's Biographies, Bethune cites that educational design was her favorite type of work, but that she could not pursue it exclusively because the first woman anything could not uh, afford to, to be an expert, but, had to, um, but she had to demonstrate her skill across all facets of the profession. Quicker stated that, that the following regarding Bethune's public school number eight, it is said by those who have seen the plans that besides being the finest arranged school in the state, it will probably take the lead over most in the country. Mm. By today's standards, these schools were typical, but they became standards for a reason. They work. At this time, school design was matriculated from a one-room schoolhouse model to serving larger populations. Classes became segregated by age, and bathrooms and by gender were added along with multiple means of egress and predictable and safe heating and ventilation. Louise stated that she assumed complete control of the work of the office, and she made sanitary drainage for a special department. <laughs> that sounds very boring to me, I'd have to say, but anyway, all the, yeah. all the plumbing is left for her to plan. In a city where cholera broke out regularly in certain neighborhoods and fire was a real threat, this was innovative work indeed. Factory design was another staple in her office. A particular note was with you sole female client, Sarah Howard, for a weaving factory as part of the Howard Iron Works. Two other innovative buildings uh, are the 74th Regiment Army and the Hotel Lafayette. The 74th Regiment Army became Elmwood Music Hall due to its excellent acoustics, and it was in use until Klein Hand's Music Hall was opened in the 1930s. And no discussion on Louise Bethune would be complete without a mention of the Hotel Lafayette. Bethune received this commission from Joseph A. Oakes and Charles A. Pooley. Oaks and Pooley were previous clients of Bethune. They were directors of the Jab O Cereal Coffee Company for whom Bethune, Bethune, and their partner folks had designed their factory in 1898. The firm had also designed a house for Joseph Oaks. These developers were stuck beside the firm throughout the various financial and schedule setbacks when the relative lack of experience in hotel design was cited for the cause. The firm persevered and the masterpiece became a reality and immediate success. Located in downtown Buffalo, the seven-story, 225-room Renaissance Revival Hotel featured hot water and cold water in all bathrooms <laughs> and telephones in all rooms. It was praised as one of the most perfect of the appointed and magnificent hotels in the country. When it opened in 1904, an expansion of the Hotel Lafayette, also designed by the two with the folks, was planned immediately. 
In their quest for social reform of urban poverty and living conditions in concert with their fight for the vote, women began to discover their own power. As a result, they organized into clubs. These took many forms, but what united them was a desire by women to create new opportunities and communities for themselves, where they could explore athleticism, socialize, have intellectual experiences, especially important at a time when higher education was so limited for women. They could pursue cultural interests, practice public speaking, and even make professional connections. Not all clubs had clubhouses, but the creation of clubhouses was an important way in which women extended their right to public space, since it represented something that was neither wholly domestic nor fully public. It was an intermediate form of public space which they could control. Buffalo's 20th Century Club is the second oldest club in the country, whose purpose was to advance the interests of education in literature and art. E.B. Green was the architect, and the most socially connected architect in the city. He had just designed the newly opened Buffalo Club just down the street for men, so it can be assumed that the club sisters wished to compete uh, with men on their own terms. During the 1890s and 1900s, there were approximately 20 clubs in existence in Buffalo, and one of them was the Buffalo Women's Wheel and Athletic Club. Mm -hmm. The women, the members of the Women's Wheel and Athletic Club of Buffalo thought that they had founded the first such club in America, but they were shy of this. They were shy of this just by a few months. The first women's group was established in Washington in January, and ours on June 26, 1888. But it was extraordinary because it was founded so early, but also because of its membership. Most of the members were professionals, and some of them were pioneers within the profession. The club boasted four physicians, including President Ida Bender, the first woman doctor in the city. Annette Rankin, the first woman to graduate from the dental department at the University of Buffalo. Numerous school teachers and principals, and Louise Bethune. Indeed, Bethune was the first woman to buy a bicycle in Buffalo at a cost of $150, or $3,898 in 2017. I am not remembering this, but I do want to point out my absolute favorite quote of Louise with you. I'll put a, I'll wrap a girdle around the earth in, in 40 minutes. I think we should all. Words to live by. I love that quote. <laughs> Motivated by a desire to overcome prejudice and heckling of women who dared to ride a bicycle, these ladies banded together to bring dignity to wheeling and therefore athleticism and also freedom. The club grew and flourished, creating new sections for walking, billiards, golf, and bowling, and they were more than proud that some of the best-known women in the city had become its members. Of utmost consideration was the uniform. Said Captain Emma Billiam, we think that the wheeling costume should be nearly as like a riding habit as possible, close-fitting and inconspicuous. The hat we wear is felt, which is comfortable, and does not blow off easily. <laughs> One meeting was entirely dedicated to the style of hat to be worn. <laughs> this may seem like Gilded Age frivolity from our 21st century perspective, but it was very serious business. These founding members were making a statement about fairness and equality, and they were risking their hard-fought hard positions in society to stand on principle. As such, members would need to look respectable at all times. The bottle green dresses of the Women's Wheel and Athletic Club members and their counterparts would ultimately revolutionize women's dress, challenging corsets and practically long dress coats. Susan B. Anthony would say, let me tell you what I think of bicycling. It has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. It gives women the feeling of freedom and self-reliance. Therefore, in their own way, these professional women were challenging the image of an athlete, a professional, and a woman. 
They were embodying the challenge of Louise Bethune for every woman to be her own architect. Dr. Liesel Folks, Dean of the UB School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, cites the inherent immaturity of an innovative company or society. By that, she means that innovators often lack the institutional memory and, th and are therefore free to invent new type technologies, services, or professions. Living in a newly wealthy city at the gateway to the Middle West, Mariah Love, Harriet Townsend, and Louise Bethune and their supporters saw a great need and therefore great opportunity for progress. And they lacked the regard for past norms to make change. Their solutions set the groundwork for advancement in education, social work, and the field of architecture. Their lives demonstrate the need for a quality education, which impacts families for generations, and targeted mentorship. Friction is required to generate the need for innovation and financial support to turn a very good idea into reality. The legacy of these clever women is still with us today and is testimony to the empirical fact that regions that invest in innovation reap the financial benefits for generations to come. This afternoon, we will speak with some of today's clever women of Buffalo to discuss their innovative work and address the question of whether the stage is set for Buffalo to enter a new golden age. Thank you.